is the truth? Where do we find the truth? In the word of God. That's where we find out what truth is. This is where we find out if our theology lines up with God's truth. Um, I would love to start off uh, just by trying to do a quiz, uh, even though you're sitting at home. Uh, and and the, the quiz that I'm doing is called Name That Brand. And, and so just, I'm going to show you the portion of a logo or a trademark of, of, um, of a brand. And, and you just turn around and brag to all the people who are around you, if, you're, if there's anybody with you at home, um, to let people know that, uh, that you know what it is. And if there's nobody with you, scream it so loud that I can hear you through your screen, okay? And so, so here's the first one that I want you to look at, all right? Um, and I will also let you know that this is probably one of my all-time favorites. So, so do you know what this logo is for? Yeah, it's, it's for Pepsi if you don't know it. And somebody who lives in a Coca-Cola family, I, I just, you know, when I'm walking down the, uh, the soda aisle, right, or the pop aisle as we call it in Minnesota, and, and, uh, and as I'm walking down and I have to walk past this beautiful logo in order to, to settle for the other, the other pop, um, it just, it just reminds me of how special this is. But let's move on to the next one. Do you know, uh, what portion of, of the logo for this company is? Do you know what it is? Well, I don't know if you said it or not, but it's Tic Tac. And so if you're looking for a, a nice little refresher and you're, and you're standing there about to check out at a grocery store, feel free to, to take a peek and you will see these Tic Tacs. How about this? Heading back down the soda aisle, if you, once you see the recipe, it's like, oh yeah, that's seven up. Of course it is. The Uncola, right? And so, uh, so that's just another one where you just look at it and you kind of know what it is. How about this one? I found this out from my wife this week because I talked a couple weeks ago that, that there are certain brands that you just don't do generic of. I found out this was one of them for our house just this past week. Heinz Ketchup, right? We're not allowed to have any other brand than Heinz Ketchup. And so when I see this, I know what I am supposed to get, right? Uh, do you know what this is? <laughs> I'm actually hearing it from the few people here. Uh, it is absolutely Red Bull. I've never tried it, but you see the bowl or the two bowls uh, about to hit, to hit heads with one another, and you, you immediately know what it is. How about this one? Think of fruit. It's Dole, right? As somebody who loves pineapple, pineapple is my favorite fruit, right? Um, uh, I know what the Dole pineapple uh, logo looks like. And then this one. Now, you might be thinking that I went back to Coca-Cola just because I love my wife and it's Mother's Day, but I did not, right? Um, now, imagine you're going down the soup aisle and you already know what this is, don't you? Yeah, it is the Campbell's Soup logo. Do you know that, that companies spend thousands and thousands of dollars uh, just trying to get to the point of using their marketing and creating these logos that, that they're hoping that when you look at that logo that you're immediately connecting it in your head with something that is going to be quality, something that is going to be tasty, something that you know is going to be worth you spending your money on. I mean, I mean that's the whole idea of, of them investing in making sure that these logos or these trademarks um, are, are, are worth being etched into our minds so that whenever we go in, we know what we are looking for. The passage of scripture that we're about to look at today as we continue this message series called Like Glue, Making Relationships Stick, what we begin to see in this passage is, is that we are called to be a logo or a trademark, so to speak, in this world as well. And, and so my question was kind of, what are we supposed to look like according to this? Now, if you can see that we're talking about humility today, you're going to already begin to understand that that's a part of what our trademark is. That when people look at us, they will see that we are people of humility. But, but what is Paul trying to help the people in this passage understand? And the question is, is, is how will this connect then to um, our relationships that we have with one another? 
Before we jump into chapter 2, I just want to give a little bit of background of, of what's going on here in Philippians. Paul is in jail, right? And he's waiting for to, to be held in trial, and, and he's writing to these churches. And one of the churches is this church in Philippi. It's this, this group that he just loves so very, very much, right? And, and he's writing them, and in the intro of this, he's just talking to them, and then he shares that he has joy with them. Because, and then we hear this common, uh, you know, well-known uh, passage of Scripture, because, because he who God God, who began this good work in them, will be faithful to bring it about to completion. And so Paul already starts off by saying that, 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 that you are going to become everything that God has for you. I'm con- Paul says, I am convinced of, of this happening. And then a matter of fact, he, he actually goes on and, and he shares what his prayer is. And I just want to read this to you really quick. He says, and this is my prayer, that your love, and so now he's talking to all these, these followers of Jesus in Philippi that your love may abound more and more in what? In knowledge and depth of insight. And so Paul is saying, here's what I want for you. I want you to understand more and more about who God is, what God is all about, and how that plays out in our lives. Uh, That you may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Paul says, I want you to know these things so that you can begin to figure out how to live your life for him and then live it out so that we can move towards being people who are pure and blameless in this world, living for Christ. And, and after that, Paul just starts to talk about, the, again, one of those very, very popular verses where it says, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Paul says, I I think I'd rather go and be with Jesus because that is supposed to be so spectacular. But I find myself here. And, and, And so while I am here on this earth, and now Paul is sharing this with the Philippians, while we are here on this earth, what are we supposed to do? What are our lives supposed to look like? Paul says, for us to live is Christ. We live Christ in this world around us. He's calling, he's calling and he's reminding these people as he's reminding us today that, that our lives are to be actively lived for Christ. And then nearing the end of chapter one, he, he just, so then he encourages everybody. So I, I want you all to just stand firm in one spirit. All of you, all of the body of Christ in Philippi. And so I, I picture this as all the people who, who are involved or intend the, the Benton Church who are watching these, these online videos, right? Uh, that, that we would all stand firm in one spirit. We all have the same mindset. And then he starts to talk about this logo, this trademark that ought to be seen in our lives, starting in chapter two. And there's three questions that I'm going to do my best to try and answer as we start walking through this, this passage. And the first one is, is what's a humble person's, because we're, we find out this is about humility. What's a humble person's mission? What's the humble person's model? And what's the humble person's mindset? And Lord, as we, uh, as we begin to look at what chapter two says, God, would you help us to be people? that are willing to stand firm in one spirit. God, that we are willing to, as Paul says, uh, to, to learn these things so that we can discern how to live, so that we may be pure and blameless. Not that we're perfect, God. That our hearts and our minds are, are doing all that we can to live for you. That's what you invite us to do. Those who have given our lives to you, that's what you invite us to do. And God, as we are looking specifically at how these impact our relationships, would you grant us insight to that? And that the things that we learn here about how the community of believers lives with one another, may we take these principles and apply them to our lives and the relationships that we have. May the words that I share, God, and the things that we all hear be acceptable and pleasing to you. If you are our rock and our blessed redeemer. Amen. 
So uh, question number one is, is, what is a humble person's mission? And so as we begin with chapter two, uh, uh, Paul says, therefore, and so the therefore is tying back all the things that I just talked about, uh, because we are now people who are living for Christ in this world, and we're choosing to stand together in one spirit, right? Therefore, he says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. And so, so we have to start painting a picture of what, of what Paul is saying, because he's encouraging this group of believers. It's kind of like he's encouraging the Benton church, the people who are listening to these messages. He says, if you've experienced any support a- as a group, if you all or individually, if you've experienced any support from us being united together in Christ, for us being of one purpose of gathering and, and lifting the name of Jesus high, if, if, you, if you felt any support from that or any comfort from his love, the word comfort here is, is incentive. If your life has gotten better because you have gathered with a group of believers that are seeking to live for Jesus, if you've experienced God's sacrificial life-giving love because you've been connected with this group of people that is supporting you, and if your life has become better because of it, right? Or, or any common sharing in the spirit. And, and this is talking about partnership. Have, have you seen people who are joining together to help share the, the, the good news and the love and, and, and the works and the lives of Christ with one another, right? Or have you experienced any tenderness or compassion? Have you experienced any mercy? Have you received support from people? He says, if you've, if you've received any of these things. And the key piece that, that, that I see as, as we begin to, to make this shift in the second half of this is Paul is saying, have you ever received or experienced any of these things from other people? He says, if you have, because this is because the body of Christ is, as we're seeking to live Christ with one another, he says, then make my joy complete, which means fill my joy up to the fullest it can possibly be. And here's how you can make my joy complete, Paul says. And he shifts from being passive in the midst of the, of the community, in the midst of the body of what God is doing, to being active in, in the body. So it's no longer, what have people done to bless you so that you are cared for, that you are experiencing something, and now we get out of our comfort zone and we do these things for the rest of the community, for the rest of the body of Christ. He says, then fill up my joy, make it complete by choosing to be like-minded. Now he's starting to, he's, he's starting to talk about being active. I am going to choose to have the same mindset as everyone else in the body of Christ as we live for Jesus. Have, I'm going to have the same love, and I'm going to be of one spirit and of one mind. This is now a choice that we do. Are, are we going to just sit back and let other people do the stuff? Sit back and let other people bless me? Or are we willing to take a stand and say, no, I am going to join in on the unity of the body of Christ. And I'm going to be like-minded. Having the same love. You hear all the unity pieces in this? Being of one spirit, one mind. That's why uh, almost every week you'll hear me or, or somebody talking about the mission of the Benton Church. You know, we are disciples who are making disciples. How do we do that? By experiencing the joy of loving, learning, and living in Christ. We share this all the time because we want us to know what it means to be like-minded. What is our same love? What does it mean to be of one spirit and of one mind? We are people that, that are helping one another to not only experience this stuff, but it's loving, learning, and living that we also choose to actively make these things happen. Loving is, is worshiping God. And that's why we gather, that's why we gather for these worship services and hope to again together someday soon, right? so that we can worship God, but it's not just on a Sunday morning. It's that we're experiencing the joy of loving, of worshiping God throughout our entire life, throughout our week, each and every day. Learning. Again, it's, it's us choosing to be active in discovering what it means to live for Christ. That, that's, why we, that's why our Sunday mornings focus in on teaching, as do our small groups. That's why we encourage people to be connected with them and, and sharing with one another and praying for one another and helping one another to learn so that we may grow. And then living in Christ, another activity for us where where we are using the gifts and the passions and the talents that we have in order to bless the body of Christ. 
and maybe even the community beyond us. That's why last week we encouraged people to fill out the serve survey. Thank you so much to the 17 of you who did. But this is a call for all of us to share in this one united focus of what we're doing. Because the humble person's mission is to be focused in on what Christ is calling us to do. So Paul says, step up, get involved. Then he goes on to say, but, but make sure that you do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now, now selfish ambition is, is really just, just trying to draw, uh, you know, a, 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 a help yourself to be moved forward. It, it literally is talking about competition, right? Do nothing uh, of where in the body of Christ you are trying to compete to show yourself to be better than other people. That's not why we do this. We don't do this to gain that type of attention or vain conceit, right? Where, where it's about my ego so that I feel better about why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. We shouldn't do anything about that in the body of Christ, or in our relationships with our friends and our family. We don't do it for ourselves. He says, rather, and then the word begins to come up, in humility. Value, your, value others above yourself. And we start to get this definition of what humility is. Humility is looking and seeking the good of others. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. We're called to look for the good in others. And this isn't the normal for us. I mean, think about it. If you have a couple of toddlers that are in a room and they're both sitting there playing, and then you were to grab a ball and hand it to one of the toddlers, what will eventually happen? Well, the other toddler, when they see it, they're going to crawl or toddle on over and grab that ball. Why? Because they want to play with it. And the next thing you know, there's going to be this battle or this crying because one person has and the other person has not. And it's not just kids, is it? We adults, we do the exact same thing. We look around at what other people have, and sometimes we think, well, I wish I had that, or that's not fair. Why are things okay for them and they're not for me? I don't deserve the situation that I find myself in. I actually find it really, really fascinating, like like when new products come out, especially technology. So, so say Apple or some company, they're coming out with a new phone, right, or a new tablet or some sort of gadget that's coming out. What will people do? They're so excited to get this that some people will even camp out in tents waiting in line in order to be the first person to get this item, right? And I just find that to be so humorous because we can all get it, right, in just a matter of a couple days if we really, really want or feel the need to, to have those things. But there's another side to that, isn't there? If you've ever gone shopping on a Black Friday, you know that there's another side to this. And that people will rush into stores trying to get the deal for themselves. That that they will physically sometimes even attack and push and shove other people. People will hide things in stores so that they can go back and get it later. It, it, more, more recent and more current, we, we've seen that there are, there are stores where they're requiring people to wear masks as they go in, and people don't think they should have to. Now, I, I don't want to get into what our rights are, but I also don't think that we should be the type of people th- that are then attacking or even shooting security guards because they're saying, no, you can't come in. But what about my rights? Paul's saying, Christians... Followers of Jesus, in this world where it's so common and natural for us to be self-focused and about our ego, in this world where, where we live in social media, where it seems that the key part of everything that we do is just to glorify ourselves, to make ourselves known, to show how many likes we get, right? How many streaks we can continue. Somehow, somehow that, 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 that's a connection to how many friends I really have, which makes me feel important, makes me feel special. Paul says, Christians, in the world where it's all about yourself, verse 4, he says, we don't look to our own interests, but each of us to the interests of others. We actively step up and say, this is, my life is not going to be about me what I want, what I need. 
My mission is to see the good in others and think of what's going to be best for them in a life lived for Christ. That's a humble person's mission. Paul says to the church, this is how we are called to live. This is what we stand together in one spirit and how we live that out. And so then what's the humble person's model? If we know that that's the mission, what's our model? Or, or more accurately, who is our model? Um, but the what's at the beginning and the M's at the end seem to fit better. And so I just went with the what. But what is the humble person's model? Paul continues on to say, in your relationships with one another... Now, and remember, he's specifically talking to, to people that are in the body of Christ together. Now, of course, we, if this would be best if we behave this way outside of the body of Christ and to the entire world. If we have friends who are Christians, aren't Christians, it doesn't matter. This is really the best way that we can live for everybody. But he's specifically saying is, is in your relationships with one another, I want you to have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. Now, uh, the, the word, uh, the phrase, have the same mindset, it, it actually means to make your own attitude. This is an imperative. Paul is saying this is what we need to do. Not, not to know Jesus, right? Uh, we, 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 we come to know Christ by believing that Jesus died on the cross and rose again for our sins, and we give our lives to him, right? That's how we come to know Christ. But those of us who know Christ, this becomes our imperative. This is how we live that we have the same mindset that we choose to change our attitude to be the same as what Jesus' attitude was in this world. And then Alex didn't read this next section, but, I, but I'm just going to share a couple of verses because it, it, it shows us a picture of what Jesus was like. If, if we're wanting to know what God is like, if we're wanting to know how it, what it means to live in humility, <laughs> take a look at Jesus' life. Attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. This is, this is the imperative. This is how we live. Who being in very nature God did not uh, consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Everything that Jesus had, he said, I'm not, not going to use this just for myself. It's not going to be all about me. It's going to be about something else. It's going to be about someone else. He doesn't live his life for his own advantage. Rather, it says, he made himself nothing. Now, now the, the phrase here, it literally means that he waived his own rights. Jesus had the right to live for himself. Jesus had the right to, to take everything for his advantage. And sometimes we imagine that that's what God does or God ought to do. But that's not the God that Scripture tells us. That Jesus was the one who was willing to sacrifice and give himself. He was the one who was willing to waive his rights for the sake of God's plan. And he took on the nature of a servant, made in human likeness. He found himself in the appearance of man, and then it says, he says the word again, and he humbled himself. He looked out for what was the good for others. He was willing to become obedient to the death, even death on the cross. You ever seen the movie Groundhog Day? It's a really, really fun movie where I think the guy's name was Phil Connors, who was played by, by Bill Murray. Uh, he has to go to the town, uh, Poxitani, right? He has to go to that town to find out if, if the groundhog is going to see his shadow or not, six more weeks of winter or not, you know, that type of thing. And, and he doesn't want to be there. He, he's, he thinks that that's below him and that he should be doing other things in his life. But, but he ends up being forced to go and he's there and, and, and he experiences the day and he just can't stand that he has to be doing this thing. Then he goes to bed that night. And he wakes up the next morning, and it's February 2nd once again. And all of a sudden, he has to run through that entire same day once again. And he's confused, and he's weirded out by everything that's going on. And why is this all happening the same? He goes to bed that night, and he wakes up again the next morning. And it's the same thing. And he begins to realize that this is the life. It's the life of the same thing, and the same thing, and the same thing. So what does he do? He starts to have fun with it. He starts to try and do all these awesome things that he would love to do. He starts to pick on people and, and make fun of people and hurt people because he knows that he can get away with it. Because tomorrow morning he can wake up and it's a new day. And he makes it all about these things that he wants. 
He wakes up the next day, and it's the same. And the same. And the same. And it wasn't until he began to think about the other people in the town, think about the girl that he was interested in, and started trying to figure out a way where he could save and care for and meet the needs of the other people. It wasn't until it was no longer about himself, but others, that he was able to move on to the next day. I think that's the picture of what's going on here. That Jesus is trying to help us to understand that we can just be wandering through the same day in and day out and make it about ourselves. Or what Paul is telling us, or we could be like Christ. And stand up in unity as a group of people that are going to live for him. Which means I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to let go of my rights, the things that I deserve in this world and start caring about others and start seeing the best in them and reaching out to them and blessing them and helping them. Body of Christ, this is the model that Jesus gives us on how to live. And then a couple of verse later, uh, Paul reminds us also of what the humble person, the people who are willing to not just be passive in, in this life, uh, not just to be passive in the church, but to stand up and get involved in this, in this living for Christ together. He said, it's, uh, he said, for it's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God has a plan for us. God has certain things that he wants to have happen in this world. God wants to use us to bring good to one another and to the lives of people around us. So, so as we do this, as we begin to figure this out, as I begin to become active instead of passive, as I continue to step out in faith and trust God, he says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. And the first word here, grumbling, it's an internal thing where you're just talking to yourself and you're saying bad things. But I can't stand that, that, I, that Justin's saying that we have to do this, you know, or, or I, can't, I can't believe that, that I have to uh, walk or act or live and do these certain things. Or I can't believe so-and-so gets that and I get this, right? It's, Paul's saying, don't do these things where you're just mumbling to yourself and don't argue. And, and so he moves from internal to external. And don't talk to other people and don't complain to other people about what's going on. But do everything without complaining to yourself, without talking to others, so that you may become, and we get back to what was talked about in chapter 1, that we may become the people who are blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. The world around us is messed up. Paul's saying we don't have to live messed up in a messed up world. It doesn't have to be, our, it doesn't have to be about ourselves. And then he goes back to the trademark. The logo. Because if we are willing to live with humility with one another and the relationships that we have with others, it says, then you will shine among them like the stars in the sky. Then when people head into the grocery store to look for their products, they may see you and how you are treating other people and realize there's something different. Then at home, your, your brother, your sister, your, your parents, your children, your friends may look at the way that you are living and see you as something unique and special. They will see the mark of the humility of Christ on your life. You will shine the stars in the sky. And in the body of Christ, people will see that we all are beginning to stand up and care for and support one another and live out experiencing the joy of loving, learning, and living in Christ together. And people will see you, and the community will see us like a star shining in the sky because we think of the good of them. Lord, help us to be people that see the challenge of moving from passive to active and actively choose a life of humility, looking for the good in others, 
and living that out. God, I waive my rights, the rights that I have to live however I want. I waive those, and I embrace the life lived for you in this community that you've called me to be a part of. I am yours. Help me, God, as I stand in unison with with my brothers and sisters here to show Christ, and may that impact the relationships of the people around me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this week's message. We hope you found it both encouraging and helpful. If you did, please click the like button and share with your friends. If you want to hear when new messages are posted, please subscribe to The Benton Church. We also invite you to join us on site for worship. We're located in Benton, Kansas, just east of Wichita. Our Sunday services start at 1030 and our doors are open to everyone. For more information, please check out our website at thebentonchurch.org. What do you know about God? He loves us. He died for our sins. He helps us. He's powerful. And he loves you.